These two boys here, they're only three years old, but they have a goat disease known as oh. caprine arthritis encephalitis. They're like the veal calves of the um, of the uh, dairy goat world, all to keep the mothers impregnated year after year. These guys are the males who will never produce milk, and they're not, they're too skinny to be raised for me, even though their mothers, this particular breed, are very productive milkers. Jenny Brown, thank you so much for being willing to be in my book. How many animals do you have here? We keep on average around 200 rescued farm animals. I mean, but that includes the chickens as well. In terms of four-legged animals, we typically have around 50. Wow. Um, but, you know, we don't want to overcrowd the, air, the animals. And because we're in such close proximity to, um, to Woodstock, the village of Woodstock, it was really about location for us. So we're 23 acres and, you know, the number of animals we're able to rescue is limited, uh, but we do have uh, ongoing um, animal placement network, so any animals that we're not able to take in, we work to find homes for them. But, um, you know, the beauty of this location is that we get sometimes hundreds of people through our doors on the weekend. Oh, wow. And so all of these animals are ambassadors to our cause because, you know, sanctuaries really have the unique opportunity of putting people face to face with animals they're not used to being around and it's those animals they only know as food. Very much a part of most people's lives but only in the form of you know, meat on a plate. Mm -hmm. So this is that magic opportunity for them to meet them. They have names. They're in a loving, social, enriched environment where they're respected. And animals react very differently in that sort of environment and behave very differently in that sort of environment. So mm -hmm. um, we're on the front lines of advocacy and we think this is a great way of doing it. I was shocked to see, I just thought everything would be penned and every animal would be have its place, so to speak. The feeling I got instantly by just seeing two goats reclining as though they were posing for us almost. Yeah. They were begging to have their They're picture sun taken. They're sunbathing. No, Jasper sunbathing. and Emmett, they just, you know. Oh my hands. goodness. And you said that uh, they have a, an illness. A... They have a goat disease that uh, came from their mother. It's called CAE. It's a, it's a very common goat disease. It means caprine arthritis encephalitis. It's a virus that lives in them. There's no treatment for it. Typically when it's discovered the animals killed on a farm because they don't want to pass that on to their young and um, these guys are the unwanted uh, male kids which is a baby goat from a local dairy goat operation because people don't realize that just like cows goats have to be impregnated every year to keep their milk production up when they have a male calf they're of no economic value to that uh, farm and so they're typically s sold off as babies at livestock auctions many times being sold for meat because um, it blows a lot of people's minds that come and visit here but more goat meat is consumed worldwide than any other oh. red meat it surpasses oh. pound for pound it surpasses beef and pork oh my so goodness. you know the Middle East and in South America and most parts of Africa and I mean right Right here in our country, goat meat farms are sprouting up everywhere because we're importing 10 million pounds of goat meat annually. And so there's farmers now seeing this opportunity and um, goat meat farms are all over the country and they're treated as livestock, even though most of us have an affinity with goats and see them as sort of the safe animals, yeah. you know, that we can show our compassion and affection to. but they don't realize how uh, worldwide the view towards them is me. That is astonishing. I, I didn't know that. And the impact just of you saying it, I just wish it could be said more frequently and in more places so that people have a sense, a greater sense they of all no this. They have no idea, yeah. But the information's right online. Um, mm -hmm. There's goat meat associations around this country, and basically they aim to serve those consumers who are 
culturally used to eating goat. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. The fact that you were in television production is a big, far-flung place compared to where we're sitting right now. How did the connections, the little wires, start to connect you up to the point that you would get here? Well, I was living in Chicago. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, but I um, switched over from University of Louisville to Columbia College Chicago, which is a fine arts college and one with a m major media program, and they have um, a film and television department that's pretty well known. So I was in film school, and I was working um, at the Chicago Diner, one of the country's oldest vegetarian yes, restaurants. Yes, I know it They've well. <laughs> meat three since uh, meat free since 1983, I yes. think. And I was waiting tables there, and I met while I was in film school, and I met a woman. I was waiting on her actually, and it was a woman from PETA who did a lot of campaign coordination and she was in town to um, document and to be a part of the big annual fur funeral and basically it's like these uh, activists in dark cloaks and they're carrying coffins and they ring these bells and it's bring out your dead and <sighs> Anyway, so she needed some video assistance, and uh, it turned out that somebody that she had planned to use wasn't available. Turned out that I was in my senior, you know, documentary production class. We had a number of exercises and projects we had to do. This was perfect for it, covering a live event and sort of trying to get both sides of the controversy. And... Um, that was the start of it mm -hmm. and so i you must documented have learned a lot event, right then documented mm -hmm. that event became friends with this woman told her i wanted to get more involved because i had become vegetarian at 18 when i picked up some literature during college orientation week and realized wow. there was so much that i didn't know and having an artificial leg and undergoing almost three years of chemotherapy my first awareness was animals used in um, animals that live in laboratories and that are used for medical testing and the guilt that i felt that my life had been saved and those animals animals um, mm. were subjected to all sorts of torture and cruelty to save my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what started me on the path. That and the fact that I had a really special relationship with a cat for 18 years that I was finally that able... that Boogie? That's Boogie. <laughs> and uh, as a child, I so wanted a pet, but it wasn't until I could really play that cancer card that I was allowed to have a pet. And um, she was really special to me and, you know, grew up in a conservative Southern Baptist household and I was taught to believe that only people possess souls, only humans, and that we really set ourselves apart and we have this sort of self-appointed dominion. Dominion is over... that word that just is a... I know, and for those of us who don't really uh, subscribe to organized religion, you know, I mean as a child I did, but still, you know, it's kind of opened my world view. But uh, fast forward just a little bit, and I started doing some undercover work for PETA. Did a couple of kooky activist things for them to sort of prove my allegiance to the cause and for them to get to know me. And um, my uh, biggest accomplishment, they had flown me out to North Dakota, and I was able to break into um, a PMU facility. And what that is is it's pregnant mares that are specifically impregnated and live their lives in stalls with urine collection bag between their legs because their estrogen, the, their urine is very high in estrogen and millions of women around this country and around the world take Primarin. Mm -hmm. And there had been no video footage inside of one of these places other than really cleaned up, very sort of high-end places. That footage that I got in and shot showed in the U.S., in Germany, in Canada, and the U.K. So that was my very successful trip. Oh. Now, some assignments I wasn't successful, some that I were, but that was the one that was really groundbreaking. But my film and television career took off. I became real, you know, very busy. I had to make a living for myself. I stayed in animal rights and went to protests and, you know, supported various organizations. But it wasn't until 
I'd been working in film and television for about a decade. I lived in Boston. I worked on shows like Frontline and Nova. At least you had a venue that you could even start to approach that there would be a listening. I w but I was never on an assignment or on a project where animals were even part of the, mm. you know, the equation. Um, but it was during that time that I learned about Farm Sanctuary and went there, I, you know, I was getting disenchanted with um, my career, and it just seemed like after 9-11, all the arts funding mm. had been pulled for uh, many of the projects that I had aspired to work on or was booked to work on, and um, I didn't like the direction my career was going in. You know, my last and biggest job was for the Discovery Channel, um, and I co-produced and directed a show for them. But it was, you know, to me, dribble. It's, uh, they strip out all the intellectual content and all the talking heads with the scientists and their professors and the engineers, and they blanket it with techno music and want to add in stupid facts about how many times the steel used in this macro engineering project could wrap around the world. Yeah. And so <laughs> I just became, I was falling out of love with them. Mm -hmm. And, um, Right before that job, though, I went to Farm Sanctuary, and I immediately, I had become more aware in terms of my animal rights that the focus really needed to be on farm animals. Because if you look at a pie chart, you know, you look at the number of animals in this country that we use in laboratories, uh, at, you know, in puppy mills, and entertainment, the wildlife that shot, the animals that die at shelter, and they make up only like 2% of animals that die at the hands of humans, oh, yeah. because all the farm. rest of them are farm animals. They really need our attention and our voices, and if we can say that we are opposed to cruelty, then we need to really take a look at our eating habits. So that became my passion, and after meeting the folks at Farm Sanctuary, I, I told them that I had once before done, uh, you know, back in the 90s, I'd done undercover video work. Jean took me right up on my offer, and three weeks later, I was uh, flown to Texas visiting as many stockyards as I could get to over a week's period of time documenting downed animals and those oh. are those animals that are too weak and sick to uh, walk onto the trucks headed for slaughter so at the end of the day after being left in a pen for what could be days oftentimes without food or water um, non-ambulatory these animals are dragged and beaten and prodded and bulldozed and chained so that they can make it alive onto the trucks headed to the slaughterhouse because an animal cannot be sold for meat if they arrive dead at a slaughterhouse but yet still diseased absolutely there's no vet that's coming in and saying well this is why this animal is disabled so they could have mad cow disease. They could have a number of diseases that can be transmitted to humans. So at the time, as, as Farm Sanctuary had done for many years, they were trying to work on passing the Downed Animal Protection Act, not only for the inherent cruelty involved in their treatment and handling, but also because sick animals are making their way into the food chain. So it did finally pass, believe it or not, under the Bush administration. But, but do you think that is part of when it gets that people feel that they could be injuring themselves and oh, now yeah. suddenly because the that's, animal matters you know? yes because it's very um challenging to people the notion of this god-given right and this sort of um cultural identity we have with meat consumption and this sort of very macho and bourgeois in a, you know um, desire in terms of men thinking real men eat meat and hunt animals and then also meat eating back in the day was something that only the rich did and now because of subsidies and the oh so powerful meat and dairy industries that are some of the biggest lobbyists on Capitol Hill um, meat is so cheap 
and so heavily subsidized. Right, right. And in order to feed the population on a meat and dairy based diet, that's why factory farms exist. And we're crowding animals into massive industrial sheds in such miserable confinement that we're basically taking everything away from their lives that makes life worth living for them. And I think that if we're to aim for a moral and just and compassionate society, this is where, this is a social justice issue that needs our attention. I want to mention though, that everyone can have a little piece of you, so to speak, uh, because you wrote a book, and this is how I knew the cat's name was Boogie. Yes. And I always want to make sure we can get it into the shot. The lucky ones, if you can, yeah, perfect. Um, my passionate fight for farm animals. And the name of the pig? That's Judy, who I named after my mother. That's right over there in the pig barn. And, uh -huh. you know, Judy has, not only is she one of my sweet girls, but her and her sister, Patsy, um, came here as piglets. And can I put this in? Uh, yes, you may. <laughs> came here as piglets and are, you know, two of the sweetest pigs uh, to people. They love uh, affection and attention, but they're also sort of the sassiest, bitchiest girls that we have here. And it's funny because I named them after my mother and my grandmother <laughs> when, when they were quite small. So. <laughs> oh, I, I just think it's wonderful. And you mentioned the pig, and I saw you at uh, this new event uh, down in Soho in New York City uh, called The Seed, a two-day vegan event. Um, I was going to say fence pliers, but it's like pliers, and they cut off their incisor teeth because they'll grow out some and they'll try to hurt each other, and they don't want to hurt the meat. They don't want to leave it unsightly. And then they notch their ears. If you go to a uh, farm animal sanctuary and you see pigs that have big notches in their ears, that's not normal. That's an identification system. So I point this out. Mutilation. Cutting their testicles off, cutting their teeth off, notching their ears, all done without pain painkillers or anesthesia. Pigs are more like us physiologically than they are different. That's why they use pig heart valves for people with their heart disease from eating pigs. You know, so this is something to think about. They're so much like us, their pain is very, very real. But that's only five minutes of their life. But I tell you what, if your neighbor, if you heard your neighbor's dog had a litter of puppies and the, 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 the people picked up those puppies, cut their tails off, pulled their teeth out, castrated them with no anesthesia, you'd be calling the police. And you would get all your friends as an animal lover to get on them and to have cruelty charges pressed for that guy. But yet, we do it to animals every day. It's happening right this very minute. We do this to animals every day that we call bacon. We don't even call them a pig. I'm going to have some pork. I'm going to have some bacon. Animals that are more intelligent than dogs, we do this to on a regular basis. Thankfully, pigs that are raised for slaughter are slaughtered at 250 pounds for um, six months. So their lives are not very long, but they never go outside. Their nose is like a chicken's beak. Their nose is their hands to the world. It's how they, it's their hands. They feel out the, the earth. They nibble at young grass shoots. They love rolling in the mud. Everything that makes life worth living to these animals is denied them. And I see hipsters walking around like, everything's better with bacon. And it makes me so misanthropic. I think I'm going to scream. But that's why I do this work. Because if I wasn't educating people about how we treat the animals we eat, I'd be in a padded cell. I, you know, it's, we have to look. Gretchen Weiler, I don't know if you know who she is. She was an actress. She's done lots of stuff for animals. Passed 
away maybe five years ago such a powerful statement that she said, we must not refuse to see with our eyes what they must endure with their bodies. So we may say, oh, this is so hard to hear and so hard to look at. I don't even want to think about it. We need to think about it. How can you say you love animals if you're not including all animals? Because the pigs, the cows, the chickens, and the turkeys, they, they're the most number of animals that are out there. Is there something that you wish to talk to the viewer about uh, that will enlighten them about the short existence and what the conditions are for a chicken? For chickens, you know, when you look across the spectrum of how we treat the animals we eat, no animal suffers worse than egg-laying chickens. Um, in this country, there are uh, uh, specifically one breed uh, that's used nationwide it's called they're called broilers and this is a bird that has been so genetically manipulated that they grow to a profitable slaughter weight at 45 days of age these are the meat birds their lives are they're born in hatcheries and both male and female when they get to be a certain size start getting their feathers they go from living in drawers or small cages to uh, wide open floor in a giant industrial shed. Males and females live amongst each other with access to food 24-7 and they're so programmed to want to eat and eat and eat and eat that many of them die from heart attacks. Many of them suffer and die because they can no longer reach food or water because of crippled legs. But we have created a bird that reaches a profitable slaughter weight in 45 days of age. So if I were to be reincarnated, I'd much rather be a meat type bird because the hens that are used for egg laying, they too are born at the hatcheries that supply all the big commercial uh, um, operations, but also the backyard farmers or the free range or the cage free companies that claim that they're free range and cage free, but there is no governing body that actually monitors their claims. Um, but if you are born an egg laying chicken, the, the type that's commercially used, and we've got the white birds in this country that are commercially used, and they're a leghorn hen that have also been genetically manipulated to lay around 280 to 320 eggs a year. Now, mind you, these birds come from jungle fowl who laid 30 eggs back in the day. So that goes to show you the um, manipulative breeding and again genetic modification that happens to make these incredible productive birds. But at these hatcheries, the males are also skinny little birds and they're not going to lay eggs. So when these birds are hatched, the day that they're hatching, they're thrown out onto conveyor belts that vibrate to help knock the shell off. And then you have a team of workers going around a factory line and they're picking up each chick and they spread their legs. They can push on their vent, which is you know, it's basically their uh, genitalia, yeah, right. and they can tell if there's a male organ inside. Now, they're going so fast and doing it so fast that sexing isn't always accurate, first, first of all, but 380 million male chicks in this country are immediately thrown into giant garbage bags and tied up uh, to be suffocated, or as they're going along and doing this on the um, factory line when they're deemed to be a male they go down a chute which leads to a giant macerator it's sort of like an auger bit that grinds them up alive and they're used for fertilizer the females though um, get to spend their entire life in what's known as a battery cage which is barely bigger than an album cover and their entire lives they live with five others so there's six birds in a cage 
uh, where they can't spread their wings, they can't turn around, and uh, at about 10 or 14 days of age, they're painfully debeaked with a hot searing blade, like a guillotine blade that cuts the tip of their beaks off. Because they're crowded in together so tightly in these cages that they peck on each other out of stress. They'll cannibalize one another because they can't spread their wings, they can't go to a nest to lay their eggs, they can't peck at the ground, they can't can't scratch at the ground underneath, they'll never feel sunshine on their backs, and also that we can basically eat the product of a chicken's menstrual cycle, right, which is egg. what it is. Right. And so these eggs and these um, massive factory farms are not fertilized, they never meet their mothers, they never have access to uh, roosters, so they live these miserable, miserable lives in cages until they're about 18 months or two years old and at that time they're ripped out of the cages shoved into cages on massive trucks and they go to become the cheap uh, processed chicken that we use oftentimes in children's school lunches or in cheap chicken patties or um, you know and hungry man TV dinners and dog and cat food and there's very little meat on their bones but as long as they can squeeze the last bit of profit out of them and the reason their lives are also so short is because they've been bred to produce so many eggs which leaches all the calcium out of their bones which forms that eggshell so they have very brittle bones and when their egg production starts to even slightly wane that's when they're out the door and they figured out that it typically happens between 18 months of age and two years of age so I would never want to be reincarnated no. if reincarnation exists mm -hmm. I think the life of an egg layer they're called layer hens mm -hmm. um, is about as miserable as it gets it certainly is and I've also heard about they grow so fast that they can't stand up. You know, that's the, the meat birds, because in this oh, country, the those are the meat birds. But again, they don't have to be debeaked. Male and female live among each other, and yes, they, they eat and eat and eat and eat, and they can die of heart attacks and crippling leg disorders. We have them on a very limited diet here, where each bird gets a measured cup, a quarter cup of food a day that's really full of fiber to help things move you know through them quickly mm -hmm. they're also allowed to graze and pick bugs on the grass but um, and we have one that still lives and she's also almost seven years old from wow. when we first opened our doors um, and so we feel like we've really accomplished a lot and have shared our information of how we've treated these leg disorders but the problem is is that they're bred specifically for their meat so their organs and their skeletons mm -hmm. struggle to keep up with that rate of growth mm -hmm. that's why they die of heart attacks and that's why mm -hmm. they get crippling arthritis in their joints mm -hmm. but um, you know we it's a lot of hospice here and as long as there's a quality of life and the spark of life is in their eye and they're eating and they're amongst others we do everything for each and every one of these animals every chicken here has a name and a story and uh, incoming record and um, you know uh, uh, medical history Everybody here is, is, is treated with the same love and respect that most of us show to our companion animals, the cats and dogs amongst us. Yes. It's in our minds only, in our selective minds, mm -hmm. which animals we love and, and which animals we eat. And when someone is listening to this right now, and when we hear about any disaster, it might be a disaster that would happen in one particular day and everyone in the world knows about it. This is, these are disasters that are happening every second that we breathe. There's concentration camps across this country right now where thousands and thousands of animals are living in deplorable conditions. They're mutilated without painkillers or anesthesia. Uh, they're shocked and forced out and in of pens with, uh, into pens with electric prods. Uh, pigs, you know, they're sensitive noses, they have to stand on concrete, and then there's graded metal where they live above giant manure lagoons of all their waste, and they suffer from 
uh, upper respiratory infections. To keep these animals indoors, out of the sunshine, their food is fortified with vitamin D and they're given therapeutic antibiotics to keep them from getting sick in such an unnatural so environment. So they stay alive enough to be killed. Exactly. There's equally horrifying scenarios for all the other animals Absolutely. that people eat. And the added uh, disaster of, of all this is that the very product itself is making us sick as Absolutely. a nation or as a world, actually. Exactly. And so there's there's getting to be less and less evidence that this is what we should be doing on any level. Right. I mean, animal agriculture is the leading cause of most environmental problems that we face today. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the obesity rates in this country, We've got a problem if it costs less to buy a Big Mac than it does a head of broccoli. Yes. So poor people don't even have access to good, healthy food. Mm -hmm. Even the school lunch programs are subsidized with, you know, uh, government money, and that government you know, wants to feed off the, the meat and the dairy that they heavily subsidize as well. So um, it starts early on with mm -hmm. uh, conditioning really poor eating habits that come down from generation to generation. And, but it, what's horrible is that we're so disconnected that children aren't even told that they're eating animals. We remove the names of their animals, you know, mm. instead of hot dogs and wings and bacon, you know, if you were telling kids that you're eating, here's some pig, here's some cow, here's some chicken, and they've just read their cute little on the farm book, you know, maybe some synapses would start firing and kids would make those important connections. Right. But the parents are usually so disconnected themselves that they, yeah. it's not even in their Do you find mindset. that it's uh, the younger people bringing up this, uh, uh, these points to the, the adults more than the other way around these days? I think we're living in the time right now where we won't be able to say that we were ignorant of it. And uh, because it's getting out there, more and more people are becoming vegetarian, are looking at the way we treat these animals. And even with welfare reforms to try to abolish the most egregious forms of cruelty in terms of the battery cages used for egg laying hens, in terms of gestation crates for pregnant sows, and in terms of veal crates for calves, which are the unwanted male offspring of the dairy cows, uh, these are, um, this is confinement that is barbaric. When an animal can't even turn around or stretch its legs during its entire right. life, we need to look at our morality. What is your vision for the future? I, I think we could all imagine what that is, but I would just like you to say it. I hope that one day, maybe in the next hundred years, that we will look back at our treatment of animals with the same, and our eating of animals, with the same disgust and disdain that we now look upon the enslavement of human beings. More animals than more sentient beings and let's remind ourselves that we too are animals our dominion our oppression over other living beings has got to stop violence is on our plate three times a day and it's up to us to make that change and if you say you love animals and you're opposed to cruelty to, in, to animals you've got to take a look at the meat that you eat and realize that there are emotional beings who lived life and feared death like any one of us do to the trivial pleasure of our palates. One of your friends brought in something that John Robbins, someone that we all admire and met, someone read this at your wedding and I think for such a thing to be chosen. I don't know how anybody else would have ever chosen unless they had the convictions that you and your husband Doug do. She does very much and it, thought this was very apropos. I would to... really enjoy it if you would share that with us in reading it yourself. Sure. I know John would love it. <laughs> he gave a nice endorsement for my book. Yes. So. When each of us comes to the end of our lives, what will matter is not what our social standing was or whether the world thought we were important or influential. What will matter 
What in fact always matters are the values we uphold and the principles and possibilities we stand for. What will matter then and what matters now are the quality of love we share with the world and the statements we make with the choices in our lives. Well, thank you, Jenny, so much.